Good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar discussing giving medicines covertly and overcoming the challenges. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, my colleagues Claire and Therese who are going to introduce themselves in a moment. If you have any questions to ask, please type them on the chat box. And if you know the answer to any of the questions that someone have, uh, has raised on the chat box, please feel free to type the answer. You don't need to wait for us to uh, come in. So, so I'm Sharice Housen. I'm a pharmacist of Kevin's Pharmacist, working with Croydon CCG, and I'm also a Nice Medicines and Prescribing Associate. Hello, my name is Celia Rosabu, and I'm a pharmacist specialist for the Care Quality Commission, um, and I work in the Medicines Optimisation Team. Hi, I'm Melanie Weatherly. Uh, my day job is that I'm a domiciliary care provider. I also work with care associations supporting care providers, and I'm delighted to be a fellow of Nice at the moment, which is one of why this is of particular interest to me. So NICE produces a lot of guidance, because covert medication is an area that frightens quite a lot of people. It is quite complex. But one of the things to remember is that you're not on your own. There is guidance in the main medicines management um, guidance, managing medicines for adults receiving social care in the community. The Mental Capacity Act you will hear an awful lot about from all three of us today because it's critical to covert medication and again there is guidance on that and um, there's also a quality standard on meds management in care homes. If you're not familiar with the full guidance the quality standard is probably a good place to start so if you've not seen all of these please have a look at them later and particularly QS85. So I thought I'd start by look, making sure that we know what we're talking about and to look at what covert medication is. And we were discussing this before we started the, the webinar. And actually, it's probably easier to start with what covert medication is not. If you are mixing medication in food or drink at the service user's request, that's not covert medication. That's responsive caring um, care. However, you might still need to talk to most of the people that you're talking to in a covert medication field because it's a good idea to check with the pharmacist that the medication mixing that you and the service user would like to do is going to leave the medication still working as it was intended to even if that's what the service user has been doing for the last 20 years because that might actually be why the medication isn't doing them um, the good they would like it to Covert medication is also not the first thing to do if a service user doesn't want to take their medication. And we're going to look into that in more detail. It's not a decision that can be taken by the care provider on their own. Again, we will look into, uh, further on in the webinar at the kind of people who do need to be involved in that decision. There are a lot of people out there who think that covert medication is not allowed. It is not forbidden by CQC. It is not forbidden by the NICE guidance. It's not forbidden by any other regulator if it is the right thing to do in the right context with the right decision making and the right uh, record keeping. And also just because you're giving medication through a peg tube or in a patch doesn't necessarily make it covert. No, you can't see what the fentanyl patch is doing. But if you know that's what it is and you know it's being put onto your body, that isn't covert medication. It is, however, an area for concern for many, many registered managers. And from talking to my colleagues, it's quite a concern for our professional um, and regulator colleagues as well. So the first thing to do is to think, if someone is refusing their medication, let's listen to their behaviour. And let's think, maybe they don't need the medication. Is it essential? Start with a, a medication review, look at alternatives. Someone has a headache, they don't like taking paracetamol, a glass of water and a little bit of time in the fresh air sometimes works just as well. Or is the um, medication available in a more acceptable form to them? Is it the tablet they don't like? Is it the capsule? Maybe a liquid would work better or a patch. Could the way you administer the meds be changed? Some people take medication from some staff but won't take it from others. 
But you do have to be careful about that. We've been hearing earlier that actually if only one member of staff is able to um, support a resident or a service user to take a particular medication, it may be because they're actually administering it covertly without anyone else knowing. The time may be easier, the environment. Asking people to take medication in a busy environment might not work. It's probably not good for any administration, but certainly for someone who's um, reluctant to take medication, shall we say. And, and the way it's presented, if someone takes lots and lots of medication and it's given to them all in one go, for some people, that's overwhelming. For other people, that's the way they want to do it. So you need to think with the person, listen to what they're telling you, whether by their behaviour, uh, talk to others around them. And I know that that can be difficult, because when someone refuses to take medication that is essential, it can often very easily become escalated into quite a challenging situation. So maybe the first thing to do is to ask someone else to start the conversation um, and to look at what else we could do. If you do decide that covert medication is going to be the only possible uh, solution, as a care provider, what I would say is, remember, it's not just us that find this area difficult and complex. In a, an article in the Pharmaceutical uh, Journal, there was a, a lovely phrase saying that covert medication is a complex process requiring multidisciplinary assessment, which again is another reason why, if there is an alternative, let's avoid it. So if you've decided that you do have to do covert medication, the next thing to think about is who needs to get involved. Quite often it can be just a conversation between a care manager and a senior clinician. And unless it's an emergency, that's really not good enough. Take the time to listen to everybody else. And as you're listening, listen out for even more opportunities to say, actually, that might be a better idea than covert medication. And the kind of people you need to listen to are the primary care, including the prescribers. And it's a good idea to talk to pharmacists, because often the pharmacists will know lots of different ways to present medication that the GP may not, may not be aware of. You also need to include adult social care because as you're going to hear later, the Mental Capacity Act and best interest decisions are absolutely fundamental to covert medication being appropriate. And adult social care is usually where those um, experts lie. I've also included key staff members, and I don't just mean the senior carer or the um, clinical lead. The key staff members we need to listen to, a bit like the family and the loved ones, the people that really know the service user. And that can be difficult to engage family members and key staff members who are frontline staff into what can be a complex decision. But as a, as a care manager, that's part of the job. Because what we want to do is make sure that we do the best we can for the service user and we need to try and hear their voice even though they themselves probably can't articulate what the issue is. And it may be that you need an attorney. If there is one, so if someone's got a power of attorney, they need to be at the table, or an advocate, particularly if the Mental Capacity Act issues are complex or borderline. So this is not something to do lightly. Um, and all of those people will have a different view, possibly. So you need to have a, a situation where you can listen and take notice of what each other is saying. The other thing that is vital in um, covert medication is good record keeping. So you, you've decided that there isn't any alternative. They do need this medication. You've listened to everybody else. And a covert way of um, administering the medication has been agreed on. So we need to make sure that we write down what did we do. Does the care plan say what we're going to do? Is it recorded properly on the mark sheet? Is it in the daily care notes? Why did you do it? What alternatives have you tried? What's the best interest decision under, underlying this? Who was involved? When will the decision be reviewed? And that's one that people often forget. And just because my medication is being administered to me covertly 
doesn't mean to say that that's the way it is for the rest of my life. Um, so decide when the review is going to be and bring everybody back together. And, and the other thing is governance and escalation. Have you got policies and procedures that match what you do? And what are you going to do if you can't get other professionals to engage? So the review date's coming round and nobody else is interested, which can happen sometimes, but if you've got an agreement across your system of what the um, escalation procedures are, that makes it a lot easier. And I would suggest that for record keeping, policies, governance, it can work much better if you have an agreed process across your locality and in an ideal world across your health and care system. That won't be as quick and easy as doing it within your own organisation but it does mean that you're not on your own and it means that everybody's keeping what they know are the right records because one of the concerns I found is that you think you've done the right things and you are administering medication covertly but it is something that we worry about and if the way that you make the decisions and how you record it has been agreed with your local pharmacist and um, primary care colleagues and has been um, and CQC have been involved as well so that when inspectors go into homes they know what to expect it can get rid of a lot of the concern both for care professionals and families because to agree to let medication be given to your parents covertly against their knowledge again can be quite a difficult thing to do but if it's in the context of health and care system across a locality and not just what one particular care home might want to do it can make that feel a lot easier as well. I'm going to hand over to Sharice now who's going to take us through more technicalities but we've just lost the slide so don't worry Sharice is going to carry on talking while we find the slide. Great okay sorry about that so um in terms of the core principles around covert administration we're going to be talking a lot of about capacity assessment medication review um documentation involving a multidisciplinary team so it's going to be a bit repetitive this webinar but hang in there um so we've talked about um someone lacking capacity and you know going through this process but we need to really you know early on say that if someone declines to take their medication and they have capacity to make this, this, um, this decision, care staff should record um, that they have declined and the reason why, if the reason is given um, on the medicines um, administration record. And then if, ha if this continues to happen regularly or it, it may present a risk to the person's health, they should then liaise with the prescriber to review the person's treatment and it may be possible to actually stop the medicine or prescribe an alternative. So, you know, from the onset, what we're saying is that if someone has capacity, uh, we're not, if this is not what we, we're talking about in this context with regards to covert administration, but there is a process that needs to be followed. If someone has capacity and is actively refusing, the, the, the care provider must have um, some kind of process for dealing with that. Um, so then that now takes us to our next, our next slide which is about the first step so treating people without their knowledge is a last resort and but it can be justified under the mental capacity act provided that the necessary steps are taken and what is really paramount is actually taking into consideration people's past and present wishes and making sure that if we're going to be um, advocating that this medicine is um, you know needs to be given covertly that we are sure that it's um, essential, that it's necessary to save life, prevent deterioration, or to ensure that it um, has some improvement in the person's physical or mental health. So it's not a decision that's taken lightly, but provided that you follow the, 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 the proper steps, you can, you know, there's a way of working this through it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about when we will consider the times where covert can actually be justified. So the first step is to think about whether the person is actively refusing their medicine. Um, I know we get a lot of questions um, around someone who isn't necessarily refusing their medicines. For example, maybe they are um, 
taken them but they don't know that it's being put in yogurt and whether or not that's covert the issue there is that it's still a medicine being given in a way that is not how the manufacturer has intended and you might need to be thinking about whether that's being done in the best interest of the um, person involved and whether you know if that is safe to do and you might want to consider that in a multidisciplinary team environment anyway so it might not be under the definition of covert and you might not have the covert paperwork per se but you will definitely need to have best interest care plans and so actually some of the things that we're talking about today may be very relevant in that in that particular case okay we've just we'll see, we've just had a question um what if someone lacks capacity but the carer says they like the medicine in their food is that covert and i think that's not not a simpler question is it because it's how do you know they like the medicine in their food if they've always taken their medicine in their food and you do it in front of them that's not covert it's not hidden i think you need to go back to the definition if you're hiding something from someone it's covert if you are doing it with their the best knowledge they can have even if they've not got full capacity yes it does need the best interest decision but it's not covert medication which has its own um concerns and issues and it is a very complicated um decision very complicated and you know again going back to when it can be justified you can only even start the process of administering medicines covertly if the person doesn't have the mental capacity to understand the decision that's been made um and so that's why the principles of the mental capacity act come into play um, again, it's only something that you should ever be doing if the medicine is deemed to be essential to their health and well-being, which is why medication review is important. Because actually, if it's a medicine that they don't actually need to take um, and it's not really giving them much benefit, then before you start disguising the medicine, you may want to discuss with the prescriber whether they actually need that medicine in the first place. And it's actually a good point to you know, review and stop any unnecessary medicines if you can at that point. So going on to the Mental Capacity Act 2005, just going to do a brief overview um, because the MCA actually sets out five statutory principles and these are the values that underpin the legal requirements in the Mental Capacity Act. And the Act is all about enabling and being compassionate and reassuring and supportive of people who may lack capacity. And the point isn't to restrict or control their lives, the point is actually to protect people who lack capacity whilst at the same time as far as possible maximise their ability to participate in decision making as far as they are able to do so. So the first principle in the Mental Capacity Act is about the fact that every adult has the right to make his or her own decisions and you can't make an assumption that someone doesn't have the mental capacity to make a decision unless it is proved otherwise. So again when it comes to certain medical conditions Often it's assumed that people don't have capacity, for example, dementia. According to the MCA, you should not assume this. Um, you actually need to make an assessment of the mental capacity for each person. So it's really important you don't make an assumption there. And, and I think it's, it's each person on each decision. Exactly. So they may well be capable of deciding that they would like cornflakes, but they may not be able to decide that they would like cornflakes with paracetamol instead of sugar um, so it is a really complex thing and I just think you need to take each person each thing at a time but the easiest thing is yeah get the meds review done because actually half of this goes away and with regards to the medicines the decision to administer them covertly should be for every individual medicine so you shouldn't we do, be doing a blanket decision where it's all of the medicines that somebody as part of your multidisciplinary team decision and discussions and your best interests meetings and talks that you have with your colleagues should be assessing every single medicine because actually they, they might accept some medicines without refusing them and then there may be other ones that you do need to consider disguising them so that's really important as well okay on to principle two persons should not be treated as being unable to make a decision unless you have done all that you can to take steps to ensure that you can help them to make that decision and you know those steps have been unsuccessful so you might need to be a bit creative in how you try and establish mental capacity so what i mean by that is you may need to involve family members in terms of how you question and ask the questions you may need to use different ways of assessing you might need to use different 
techniques in communication, you might need to use pictures. Um, the point of this principle is really to stop people being automatically labelled as lacking capacity and therefore then they then have unnecessary interventions. Um, so it's really important that you make considerations that are specific to the individual that you are assessing. So principle three of the Mental Capacity Act is about the fact that just because someone makes an unwise decision doesn't mean that they lack capacity. So you can't assume that someone lacks capacity because they decide on something that you think isn't in their best interest. That's really important. So someone might decide that they don't want to take their blood pressure tablet um, and they're refusing it because they just do not want to take it. But actually that is not a measure of mental capacity. The mental capacity needs to be assessed in a bigger context with in line with all these principles that we're going through. Principle four of the Mental Capacity Act is the fact that all decisions that you're making for someone who doesn't have capacity to make these decisions for themselves have to be taken in the person's best interest. And you have to consider the impact that it's going to have on that person's health and well-being. Um, this is why it's really important to have this best interest meeting and it's really important to involve the key people that we've discussed already, so health professional that's prescribing the actual medicines, an advocate for the person, whether that's um, an independent advocate or whether that's the person who's the power of attorney or a family member, um, the staff that are looking after that person and additionally a pharmacist or someone who's a medicines expert that can tell you the best way to to disguise that medicine in a way that is safe and it can continue to be effective. It's really important that you keep records of what is discussed at this meeting as well. Um, if the situation is urgent, it might mean that the meeting doesn't take place in person and it doesn't have to be in person, but what's important is that the decision is documented. Um, it could be, the meeting could be conducted over the phone. I've seen cases where the meeting is conducted over email and um, email messages go back and forth between the key people. But what's really important is that it's documented and all the staff that are providing care know exactly what has been decided and therefore know exactly how to give the medicines in a way that is safe. We're having a lot of questions coming up. Um, I think we about what is covert and what isn't covert. And I think it might be quite helpful to, to have a little chat about that. I think. Um, if you are giving medication to someone who does not understand the medication, someone with a profound learning disability or advanced dementia, that automatically does not make it all covert. You, you need to start with covert medication happens when someone refuses to take their medication mm -hmm. and is clearly saying, I don't want this. So I think whether or not it is in um, thick and fluid, because that's what the SALT team have said is the best way for that medication to be taken is not the same as covert medication and I think some people are saying that they um, are experiencing confusion when CQC come or other people come and I think it's really important that the staff involved understand yep. the difference between covert medication and medication that is being made easier to take. Exactly, they're very different. They're very different. They are easy to confuse particularly around um, people with, lack, with uh, fluctuating capacity and I think that's why I would go back to do this as a system, get your health and care system for your locality in a room, thrash out these questions and agree what for you in, we've got people from all over the place, so in, in Bournemouth, in Bournemouth if we had a situation where the SALT team are saying Mrs X has been taking her tablets but she's really struggling to swallow them, they're not available in liquid form so let's do something different, that isn't covert medication. Yeah. But you need that written down and agreed so that everybody in your locality at least is on the same page yeah. and then gradually the whole country will be on the same page. But your staff need to know the difference so that when they're challenged they can say I do this medication in the best interest of someone. There will always be a best interest decision but it will be a best interest decision about them having the medication not their best interest about them having their medication even when they have clearly said they don't want it and maybe that's the difference. There's a best interest decision that they need the meds which is actually usually often taken by the prescriber and then there is another best interest decision if you are giving them their medication despite their behaviour telling you they don't want it. I don't know whether that helps people listening but it, 
I, I, I think it might do. Sorry, that's Dear, fine. I, I jumped in. That's okay, thank you. Um, so going on to principle five, it's about the fact that when you're making a decision or acting on behalf of a person who lacks capacity, you need to consider the fact whether it's the path of least restriction um, and whether there's a need to do this at all. So, for example, um, rather than disguising the medicine in food or drink, would a change to the formulation of that medicine mean that the person won't refuse it? So are they refusing the medicine because it doesn't taste very nice? And actually, if even though they lack the mental capacity to um, make that decision and you've done all the right assessments, if you gave them a liquid version, would that be more acceptable to them without you having to disguise it? So it's about doing what's least restrictive to that individual. So the next slide is about assessing mental capacity and um, there's again four steps to this process. So the first step is about um, well, the four, the four steps are about the person not being able to make their decision if they can't do one or more of these steps. So if they can't understand the information that you've provided to them about their medicine, and that's if the information's been provided in a way that they can understand as far as is practical, they can't understand and then they can't hold that information for long enough to make a decision on it. Thirdly, they can't understand the risks and the benefits of that medicine and understand the consequences of not taking the medicine. And then fourthly, if they can't communicate their decision in the normal way that they communicate, those are the four steps to assessing mental capacity. So if one or more of those steps isn't able to be completed, then it suggests that the person doesn't have mental capacity. Therese, can I ask you a question? We're talk there's someone talking there about um, someone with capacity but is aggressive and won't take the medication. I am I right in thinking that's a, a mental health act issue rather than a mental capacity act issue? So it, it might be a mental health um, issue. And again, it's it's about having that medication review and discussing it with the individual and identifying um, and then coming to the, some decision in whether or not it's, you know, if the medicine is essential and rationalizing it with them because sometimes the actual medicine that they are um, refusing in the grand scheme of things doesn't have any bearing again on their physical or their mental health or it doesn't um, prevent uh, you know their, their condition from deteriorating so it's about the actual medicine itself and understanding why that person is possibly making that if decision. you're looking at something like a, a lorazepam to calm someone down, that would be you'd have to section them first, wouldn't you? Exactly. Yeah. And if they've been sectioned under the Mental Health Act, that's a completely different situation. That's a different, yeah. And that's not what we're talking about here. Yeah. No. But yes, there may be situations where if someone is a, har a risk of harm to themselves or yeah. others, that's a different decision. Your GP, your psychiatrist may well choose to section them for treatment. Yeah. That's not mental. That's not covert medication and not really something that the care home staff should be getting involved in unless they are acting directly under the instruction of the appropriate clinician who is saying, please can you help us with this person. So we've had a couple of questions about that. Um, and I think that may be something similar if you're talking about um, an emergency. If you're talking about an emergency, the, the individual still has the right to say, if they have capacity, I'm not taking those antibiotics, the same as any of us do. But if it is felt to be serious enough, then there may well be a situation where the Mental Health Act, rather than the Mental Capacity Act, comes into play. Yeah. But that's really not what we're talking about here. Yeah. And again, as a, as a care home, if a doctor is saying you've got to do it anyway, then our challenge and say, what are we talking about here? Has this person been sectioned and therefore we're doing it? Um, but if they do have capacity, then... I suppose you're right, someone's just said if it's sectioned and have capacity, the medication can't be given covertly, but it will be given whether you wanted it or not, which is possibly get the same solution. Exactly. But we're talking about here someone for whom it has been agreed that the medication is essential for their well being, their health and well being, yeah. but they don't have the mental capacity to understand that. So we collectively, and it needs to be collectively, make the decision in their best interests. So that, that is very different than anything that might involve someone who has capacity and that's way outside our scope. Okay, so I'm just going to run through um, 
the CQC key lines of inquiries, otherwise known as CLOEs, that all um, CQC um, adult social care inspectors should be using when we are assessing covert administration. So it's um, called S4.4 and it says, are there clear procedures for giving medicines covertly in line with the Mental Capacity Act? So that means that across the country, whenever you get a CQC inspection, these are the these are the things that the inspectors will be looking for. So it won't be different anywhere. It'll be these three points. Um, and they are based on everything that we've discussed throughout the session today, and it ties in with what's recommended as good practice as well. So the first thing is about a capacity assessment. There should be an assessment that the person um, that shows that the person lacks capacity to make decisions about medicine. So it's got to be specific to medicines. You might have capacity decisions about lots of different things, but if you're doing covert administration, that's what we're going to look for. Again, there should be a best interest um, decision paperwork to consider each individual medicine. And again, this should be the last resort. Um, so on the slide, it says a best interest meeting. Again, as I've said before, it doesn't have to be a physical meeting where everyone's in the same room. So that might not be practical. It might be that it's something that you discuss on the phone or it's something you discuss over email. Um, and, it's some, and it should be something that you review um, periodically as well. And lastly, Ideally, there should also be a discussion with pharmacy. I say pharmacy, it could be any medicines expert about how to administer medicine safely and ensure continued effectiveness. So the information doesn't have to come from a community pharmacy, but there should be some information to show how the medicine will continue to be safe and effective. And we can't assume that it's safe to just crush um, every tablet or dissolve it in water. Um, when you're changing the way that medicines have been licensed to be used, then you're giving medicines outside the scope of their license. And so there should be individual information on how this should be done safely. Um, it should be documented, it should be available to every member of staff, and it should be understood by, by every member of staff as well. I, th I think we've got a little bit of confusion again going on in the questions. We're not saying that you necessarily need a best interest decision to administer medication in food, but what you do need is a, di is a discussion with someone who understands the pharmacology in the medication probably a pharmacist would be the best place to start because that might be my choice to do that but I need to make that decision properly I need to know what difference that's going to make to the medication yeah and I actually have a query like that this morning coming to my um, the mailbox and that was from a uh, care home who had a, a new resident come in and both her and her husband explained at home they tend to crush all her medicines they have been doing this for some time um, the, they're, they're not, she's not self-administering and the nurses are taking on responsibility for administration of medicines and, and quite rightly they've asked, you know, is this possible, you know, can we do this, you know, this is a list of medicines, can you assure us that, um, you know, we are, you know, that we're able to crush the medicines. So it's that, this was the established way that that individual took their medicines when they were at home. They've come in to the, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the care facility and those who are not responsible for administering the medicines just want some assurance that if they continue to do it in this way that you know that they're safeguarded themselves and that you know that the medicine continue to be administered in a safe and effective way so there's that aspect of it then there's an the individual who um, has capacity but might be refusing medicines as, as we said you need to go through and understand why they might be refusing identify where the medicine is essential to, to begin with and take the necessary steps and liaise with the healthcare professionals and then we have the other individuals who lack capacity are refusing their medicines and we're going through this you know understanding whether or not covert administration is um, an appropriate or the least restrictive way of actually administering their medicines so we continue thank you Sherry that's a really clear description Okay, so the other key line of inquiry that's um, really relevant here is um, S4.6, and it's about how do staff assess the level of support a person needs to take their medicine safely? And it's really particularly important when there are difficulties in communicating and where medicines are being given covertly and when undertaking risk enablement assessments are designed to promote self-administration. So again, how do staff decide if a person needs to be given their medicines covertly? Is this something that's discussed with a multidisciplinary team? Is it something that's always a last resort or is it something that is sort of like the first line of um, solution when there's a problem with people taking their medicines? It really should be a last resort and you should make all reasonable efforts to give medicines in a way that, you know, in the normal manner where you can and then consider alternative forms of administration, like we've mentioned, different formulations. Um,
Okay, so just to recap on the responsibility of um, care providers, um, health and social care providers should ensure that the process for covert administration clearly defines who should be involved in it and who's responsible for the decision making. Um, again, this is all in um, clearly laid out in the NICE guideline on manager medicines in care homes. So there should be an assessment of mental capacity. There should be advice sought from the prescriber about other potential options and whether the medicines can be stopped, whether they're all required. Um, there should be a best interest um, decision um, documented that involves relevant parties, i.e. family, prescriber, pharmacist, um, and the staff in the actual care home as well. The recording of these decisions um, and planning how those medicines will be administered in a way that is safe after you've sought medicines administration advice. Um, again, this decision should be regularly reviewed. I've been um, on inspections where we've seen covert administration um, plans in place that are four years old and they've not been reviewed since then and in that time the medicines that are being disguised are completely different, so that's not appropriate. Um, again, providers are free to decide how often they wish to review that, but it might be that you set a time frame, say for example every six months you're going to review that, but within the six months so many medicines have changed you might need to bring the review date forward. Yes, at this point, you just want to remember that if the person has capacity, they're entitled to refuse treatment for both physical and mental illness, even if such a decision is considered to be unwise by others. And that giving medication covertly to someone who has capacity is a form of abuse. And people with a diagnosis such as mental illness or learning disability do not necessarily lack capacity um, in this regard. And then some preventative medicines need to be given for several years to show any benefit. So depending on the person's prognosis, the risk-benefit profile may not be favorable for that person. So again, that's why it's essential that you know, someone might have been put on a medication for, um, let's say, hypertension um, a long time ago. But if we did take their blood pressure now, we would realize that actually they, sh they don't need to be on their medicine. And if they're refusing to take that medicine coincidentally at the same time, um, you know, that's, way, that's why the value of having that medication review. And then it's also about considering the pharmaceutical issues in terms of how that medicine is going to be absorbed if it's been given in food or drink, the interactions that it might have. And very important in terms of the taste when it's been administered covertly. Um, later on in the webinar, I'll give an example with regards to you know, a medicine that altered the taste um, in terms of some food the individual was having and the impact that had on, you know, on, the, on the service user. So um, I know one of the questions that came up earlier, and we, we, which we wanted to highlight within this webinar, is who um, can assess mental capacity? And what it is, is usually someone who's appropriately trained can do that. And sometimes that is conducted by a senior care or nurse involved in daily administration of the medicines. Or it could be um, a GP or pharmacist. And in practice, it tends to be a GP um, when we've seen it done you know, in, care, in care services. But that doesn't mean that others can't do it, provided that they've had the appropriate training and understand how to apply it. And in most complex cases, sometimes a specialist is involved. So sometimes you have the psychiatrist or psychologist having to come in to be involved in that decision making. So if we go back to um, helping people to make decisions for themselves, is again, ensuring that the person has sufficient information to make that decision and that the information is presented in a way that's easy for the person to understand. And is it particular times of the day when the person is more likely to engage in that conversation? So I had a resident um, in a care home that I was asked to go and speak to because from all accounts, she had capacity, but she'd started to refuse her medicines in the evening. And, you know, so I, so I was like, so when is the best time to come and speak to, you know, the, 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 the patient? And they said, oh, well, you can, it's best to come in the morning or um, just before lunch because she tends to go for dialysis and when she gets back in the evening, um, you know, she's quite tired. Um, coincidentally, it's the evening tablets that she's refusing. So I thought, well, no wonder because she's tired. She's gone through, you know, she's been on um, patient transport. She's been to dialysis. She's come back. And then as soon as she comes in the door, because, it, it's, you know, the medication around, it was due around then. Um, everybody's just, you know, approaching her, you need to take your tablets, and she's like refusing. So sometimes 
when you speak to providers and you, work, you you get them to start to think about you know what is it that they actually the activity and what is it they're trying to achieve and the timing sometimes you can you know clear up things even before actually having to go through um, the whole process and then can someone else help or support the person to understand information or make a choice and I think it's particularly important um, if you know if there's a language barrier and you know how do we um, ensure that people are given information in in the way that they they're, they're able to accept it and understand it and I think linked to it too and quite often we see is that um, no next of kin documented on paperwork and that's not that's not appropriate you know we have people um, you know imcas who are available to take this take the person's um, situation into consideration and consider what their previous beliefs were um, and what they might have had documented at some point and then help the rest of the multidisciplinary team to come to that decision. So if someone's refusing medicines, um, we need to consider, is the medication mainly refused at certain times of day? So if we go back to my example with the lady who was coming in back into the home having had dialysis and refusing those evening medicines, is it only a particular medication that's been refused? So I've had people refusing eye drops. And then you talk to them and you say, well, how do you administer the eye drops? Well, well, we take it from the fridge, we go up to the individual, and we, I'm like, well, maybe they just don't want to have something cold, you know, popped into their eye. And there are medicines that are constantly refused or taken some days and not others. And I think um, Melanie alluded to this. It's important to... to actually if you're going in as a healthcare professional and like as a pharmacist or pharmacy technician and looking at the um the mar chart and there is there reports that this person's refusing medicines but there are occasions when they are taking the medicines it's important to understand how is that in the the, the, the care staff able to administer the medicine is it because they like the approach the person um uses or is it that the person's actually started to give the medicine covertly and having not, having not documented or gone through the appropriate processes. So there are two sides to that. And what has been the consequence of refusing the medicine? So if someone is on medicine, that's, uh, hypertension tends to be my, my, my go-to one because um, typically sometimes in the care homes that, we, that I deal with is the elderly frail and we know as people get older sometimes their, their need for certain medicines changes and sometimes we're more trying to prevent hypotension than it is um, with regards to hypertension. And what is the consequence of actually refusing this medicine? So sometimes it's about documenting what is happening if the person has had that medicine for some period of time. And does the medication need discontinuing gradually or are there acceptable alternatives? Um, does the medicine have a side effect? Does it cause confusion, drowsiness, which might have an impact on the person's cognitive function and which might be contributing why they're suddenly stopping, you know, starting to refuse the medicine? And does the person have fluctuating capacity is one of the other um, things we need to consider in terms of when we come into our decision making. If we think about the best interest decision, I think we've talked about this a lot in terms of who needs to be involved, the person, and it may not be physically present, but it's about their past and present wishes, their beliefs and values, care staff, healthcare professionals in terms of those prescribing, the pharmacist to um, advise on the most appropriate way to administer, and then a family member or advocate. Um, just wanted to highlight something about the depri dep deprivation of liberty safeguards. So if the, one of the medicines that is being considered for um, covert administration alters um, individuals' behavior in some way in that it um, might cause them to become drowsy or dizzy or control their behavior. That needs to be taken in consideration because it could be seen as um, a form of restraint or restricting that person's um, liberty. So sometimes um, for that particular medicine, so your anxiolytics or so, that might need to be taken um, to, you know, in terms of uh, uh, adults might need to be taken out with regards to the action in t terms of giving that particular medicine covertly. So we, we, we kept, we will keep going on about documentation. So it's really important that information is documented. And someone asked earlier on whether or not the pharmacist, um, advice from the pharmacist um, is given, needs to be written. And I think it's really important as a healthcare professional, if you're giving someone advice and in advice in this context, that um, you provide that as written ad advice and as much as possible for your own records too. So you know what information you have given. 
um, and they they have a record in terms of you know what um, what advice has been given and you know if you, you want you could include your reference sources and I think too for pharmacy professionals as given when given in that advice you need to understand the context for well, sometimes you get a call and it's can this medicine be crushed or can this medicine be given in food or drink and you need to understand whether or not is it covert administration or is it something else um, so just two quick case studies. So I alluded to the fact in terms of, you know, when you put the medicine into food or drink, it can alter the taste of the food. So uh, we had one case where um, a patient had started to refuse their, med their food and was losing weight. And the call came in to come in to review them um, and because they wanted to start them on supplements. And what transpired through that conversation was that this individual was a gentleman who the home felt um, was displaying challenging behavior and they had started to, um, they had, he'd been prescribed haloperidol to address that matter and he, had, he was already on medicines for um, hypertension and a few other things um, for his bowels and pain relief and because he um, you know was displaying these challenging behaviors they'd started to get put his medicines into his food um, and he'd started to, to stop eating Obviously, he might he must have realized that there was something in the food, and he'd stopped eating. And their concern was that he was losing weight. But I said we need to go right back to the basics, and we got everyone around the table and included the family. And the behaviors that were being um, he was displaying, when we got down to the bottom of it, this gentleman had been a caretaker at a, at a, at a school for a number of years prior, you know, prior to retirement, and. Essentially, what he'd been doing in the care home was getting up really early in the morning and moving around the chairs and the furniture in his room, and you know, you know, because that was that was his routine, and he just reverted to a previous behavior, and this was something that was really clearly documented in his "This Is Me" um, profile, but no one had actually taken that into consideration. So I would like to say, for this particular gentleman, it wasn't a case of sorting out, you know his refusal of food and maybe looking at, you know, uh, food first or supplements or whatever it might be. But it was getting the home to understand this was a, he was just reverting to a behavior that he'd previously done. And maybe when he got up at that time in the morning, it was to give him an activity for him to, you know, to feel involved and include, you know, to, to be occupied and not to medicate him. So we were able to stop the haloperidol. We were able to do a medication review with his other medicines. And you know, we, we identified the medicines that were, you know, that were essential, and some of them we changed to different formulations. And he was more acceptable, accepting of it. And we tried it for a little time, and then a few weeks, um, a month or two after, I went back to the home, and you know, the carer said to us that you know he had some relatives visit um, the weekend before, and they were so surprised because he actually recognized his granddaughter for the first time in a very long time. And they thought, they, they thought, well, you know, this is a different person we have. And simply by going back and understanding the individual, sometimes you can do a world of good. And you know, we haven't, we weren't, we didn't have to go down that path of covert administration by simply understanding the individual. My next case study, um, I'm, I'm conscious of time, is that we had an individual with, um, who we'd done the covert process, everything was in line. But in terms of how that, in, that medicine was going to be manipulated and put into food and the safeguards around that, that wasn't very clear. So the medicine was prepared in the kitchen, brought out to the dining room. That individual was late coming down and their porridge was fed to someone else. So someone else got a cocktail of the, in, the person who was to have the medicines given covertly. So it's really important that not only do you do the process around identifying what medicines can be given covertly, that covert med covert administration appropriate, but how that is dealt with in the care setting. So in terms of getting it wrong, we're just going to quickly go through. Um, so I think Melody wants to say Now, just, I think that those case studies really show that um, actually when someone refuses their medication, our first thought shouldn't be how do we covertly give, them to, give it to them, but maybe they're right. Maybe they don't need that medication. Maybe that's not the right thing to have gone for. So I think the story about the caretaker is fabulous to say, actually, covert medication is often the first thing, and it brings with it food supplements and all sorts of other um, issues. So I think that's a really fabulous case study. We've had a couple of questions about practicalities, and, and one of them was, was about 
uh, and it sort of goes to your case, second case study, really, in a way, how do you measure the quantity? And I think that whether it's covert or with permission uh, medication, if you are adding medication to food, it's really important that you talk very, very closely with your pharmacist and say, okay, if we're going to give this medication in this way, how careful do we have to be? Particularly yeah. if people don't eat all their food. Yeah. And most medications are not that specific in terms of dosage. Yeah. But if they are, you maybe need to do that. But you need to, it takes me back to don't make the decision on your own. Talk to the experts. Yeah. So in this particular, in the last case, in terms of them mixing it up and putting it in the whole bowl of porridge, that's not, re that was that, putting it in the whole bowl of porridge too, was not the best approach also, because if you think about it, the individual may not finish that bowl of porridge and they wouldn't have gotten all of the medicines. So we try to give it in, in a small um, amount of food or drink that you know that they're most likely to consume um, without actually affecting, you know, the taste of the overall um, food or drink that they're, you know, they're going to be consuming. So it, it's one of those fine balances. But as much as possible, you, you wouldn't add it to, um, like, as I said, the, the, the whole bowl of porridge because the likelihood of maybe them finishing all of that, if, you know, for some people may not be, um, you know, that might not be the case. And then you're left with them not getting an effective dose of their medicine. So in terms of getting it wrong, we just need to think medicine should just not be added to food or drink with no prescriber or pharmacist involved or not, you know, that multidisciplinary team approach. We need to make sure that there's a mental capacity assessment that alternative methods have been considered, that there's clear decision making which is documented, that advice is received from the pharmacist and you have supporting documentation. Um, there's a clear documented process for administering the medicines covertly. There's a documented medication review. And one of the questions that came up on the chat box was um, with regards to if the dose changed. Um, you may not actually have to go back through the covert administration process, but you may need to actually speak to the pharmacist, or if a formulation's changed, again, you might need to speak to the pharmacist. But if the medicine themselves is changed, then again, you need to um, seek the, the, the appropriate information. And then having no review date documented or ongoing or indefinite recorded, that's not appropriate. As Celia said, you might want to set a limit of about six months, but the expectation is that you um, review that periodically, and that is dependent on the person's condition changing because they might start, they, you know, the prognosis might change, it might deteriorate, and you may need to go back and say, well, five months ago when we looked at this, you know, it was this was an essential medicine, and is this still essential, and what are we trying to achieve here? So best practices, um, if we think of covert administration as a last resort, that there's a best interest decision, it's medicine specific, it's time limited, it's regularly reviewed, it's transparent in that it's easy to follow, it's clearly documented, and it's inclusive. So there's that discussion and consultation with the appropriate advocates for the person, the decision is not taken alone, and you know everyone should be happy. Can I just add a really important point? There's been some really um, interesting discussions in the chat box. Um, talking about whether the medicine should be offered overtly every time you do it. Again, I think that's something that you need to decide in your best interest meeting because for some people that might actually cause more distress if they are constantly being offered a medicine that they've already told you they don't want to take and they've refused to take it. And then when you then disguise it in food or drink, they might then clock onto the fact that it is in their food or drink and stop eating and drinking. And we've seen cases like that happen a lot. So I think in your best interest me and you might decide that for someone who has got fluctuating capacity that's the best course of action to offer it overtly first but for other people that might be more harmful to do that so just bear that in mind yeah so um i think we'll just go pop to the next slide melly so um it's been really good you know in terms of the questions and so that's been coming up in the chat box um i think someone asked is there um Nice guidance for people in social care. Yes, there is. Um, there's NG67, and there's the related um, quality standards for that. Um, so there's nice guidance for care homes, for people receiving social care in the community, um, around the Decision Making and Mental Capacity Act. Um, as I said, the quality standards, and there's um, sources of information on the CQC website, and as well as, um, so one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar now is because of the new short, um, the quick guidance that's been, you know, written be, um, between NICE and SCIE. So, um, yeah, so giving medicines covertly, so that's the quick guide that's available, um, which gives a, a great overview. 
Um, Joanne raised a question saying, is there a, an easy read information to understand the benefits of medication? I don't think there is, but maybe that's something that Sharice and I could take back to NICE yeah. and say um, that what might be really helpful, particularly for people who have who are struggling to hold on to the capacity to make decisions about their medication. Um, so that's a really good point. We will we will take that that back. There's been some fantastic questions today. There's obviously still quite a bit of confusion. Maybe people struggling to get um, doles decisions linked to covert medication. Perhaps you need to get your um, doles team to watch the recording of the the video if you, the, the webinar if they're telling you that doles and covert medication don't um, come into play with each other. But also, I think. The key thing I hope you take away from this is covert medication is complicated. It's not something you have to worry about on your own, but it it's not automatically because you have put the, put the medication into another medium to make it more acceptable to the person. That's not automatically covert. And I know somebody had a question earlier saying that if your hand was around the syringe when you are doing peg feed medication. If that's because the person doesn't actually like the feel of the syringe, not sure that in and of itself makes the medication administration covert, but it might do. It, it's a bit like the Mental Capacity Act. There isn't one size fits all. It is very individually specific. Um, but the more you and your staff know about it, the better you'll be able to support your service users. If you do need any additional help, the NICE field team, if you've not met them, go and find them because they're ace and they're really supportive in things like that. Um, look that up when you see the get the slides. Um, and thank you very much for all your questions and for your attention. And thank you, Celia and Therese. I think we've had a, a good discussion. Okay. A really good discussion. Thank, thank you. you very much. I just wanted to add, um, if you go on the CQC website, there is some guidance for providers and there is a page on administering medicines covertly. So if you've it's in the what? slides. It's There's a link on the slide. I don't think it's been included. Okay, good. Three slides. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, basically there is a guideline on the website if you're um, wondering uh, what CQC inspectors will be looking for. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank it's, you very it much. It is on the slides. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.